The economy and productivity continue to increase with every new technology. Computers, robotics, power tools, the internet and satellite communications. Yet, for the middle class, wages have not increased in more than 40 years. In 2008, unemployment spiked in what is now called the Great Recession. In the 1880s, after the Civil War, productivity was rapidly increasing. By far, the railroads were the biggest factor. They connected the self-sufficient farmers with the markets of the cities. At the same time productivity was increasing, wages were slowly falling. In 1869, the first transcontinental railroad was completed. It was phenomenal. A trip from New York to San Francisco was reduced from two months to seven days. It took crops and raw materials from the interior of the country, and it took back to the previously isolated families machinery and consumer goods. Then, just four years after the railroad was completed, America was hit with the worst depression the world had ever seen. It was a circumstance very much like the recession of 2008, and it inspired Henry George to solve the riddle of poverty. Why people who are willing and able to work are unable to exchange their labor for the products of other people's labor, and why, as the result of labor increase, wages don't increase along with it. So, I present the Henry George Thesis. How to create full employment, rising wages, cheaper housing, and fund the government. Based on the American classic, Progress and Poverty, by Henry George. Today, auto companies can assemble one car for each worker in 35 hours. Robots have generally tripled the results of labor. Skyscrapers are built with advancing technology in less and less time, while single-family detached houses are built in factories, delivered by truck, and assembled in a day or two. Computers and the Internet have multiplied the rate at which we calculate, store, retrieve, and communicate information. In 2010, real U.S. manufacturing output was $150,000 per worker, a new record high, four times what it was at the end of World War II, continually increasing output while reducing the number of workers. Overall U.S. output per worker in 2010 was $96,500 worth of goods or services, again four times what it was at the end of World War II. But as a percent of the gross domestic product, wages have been falling. In 1960, they were 51% of the total value of goods and services. In 2010, they were down to 42%. In terms of what you can buy or a standard of living, the tendency of wages is to remain constant, as it has since Henry George wrote in 1879. We have intervened with the minimum wage and the eight-hour day. Employers have been forced to contribute to Social Security and Medicare. And labor unions have had some success. But the tendency continues. We have just marked the 50th anniversary of the War on Poverty. In 1964, there were 39 million Americans living in poverty. In 2012, there were 46 million Americans living in poverty. Ameliorated by food stamps, Medicaid, housing subsidies, and other programs like the Earned Income Tax Credit. In 2007, there were 156 million Americans working. Then we had a recession. 
and by 2010, there were only 145 million Americans working. From the beginning of 2007 to the beginning of 2010, 11 million less adults were working. Why? In 2010, we had the same labor force with the same skills, the same level of technology, the same natural resources, the same buildings and machines, and essentially the same money and credit system that we had in 2006, yet 11 million less people were working. As a portion of the population, 2007 began with 63.4% of the adult population working. 2010 began with 58%, 58.6% of adults working. In spite of the millions and millions of jobs that were created, 2015 started with only 1% more of the adult population working than there was in 2010 and 4% less of the adult population working than there was in 2007 before the recession began. Millions of jobs were created, <clears throat> but since the recession was over, the increase in the working age population required far more jobs than were actually created. So, we have progress and we have poverty. Why are the least productive workers always unemployed? Why don't wages increase with advancing technology? Why are the recurring periods of hyper unemployment? We turn to the productive process. Labor, mental and physical, applied to the natural resources. We combine them, we separate them, we change them in form or in place. First, we produce the capital wealth, buildings, machines, inventory, which are used to give our labor a greater efficiency in producing food, clothing, shelter, automobiles, televisions, which we store, we transport, we trade, and finally we put in the hands of the ultimate consumer. So anything that gets a natural resource to the consumer in the desired form is part of production. Why is the refrigerator on the right worth more than the one on the left? Why was the Cadillac worth more than the Volkswagen Beetle? Because they cost more to produce. Why is one of these worth a hundred times more than the other when they each cost six cents to produce? And the answer is because money has a value from decree, not because it requires labor to produce it. We know that printing money is not the same as making cars, building houses, or growing food. You can't eat it, you can't wear it, you can't live in it. But what we, do we do with money? We spend it. Money is a medium of exchange, a store and a measure of value. An increase in the supply of money does not increase the value of a nation's wealth, nor its potential to satisfy human needs and desires. Now, returning to the questions. <clears throat> Why are the very least productive people always unemployable? Can they not produce enough that they could be paid the legal minimum wage? Or are there not enough jobs? Among those who are working, why are the least educated and skilled always at the minimum wage? Do they not produce enough that they could be paid any more? I go to, into McDonald's. I see the cash register is broken, but I overhear the Cashier say to the manager, Sir, I'm about to get a degree in accounting. Don't worry. I can write the orders and make the change. However, which line will go faster? The one with the accountant who has a pencil and paper in a cash drawer? Or the high school dropout with an electronic cash register? 
She pushes the pictures. Big Mac, small fries, medium Coke. The machine adds it up and she reads it out. Sir, that will be $8.75. He gives her a $10 bill and she pushes the button with a $10 bill on it. And the machine says, give him a dollar and it automatically dispenses the 25 cents. Next customer, please. Scanners are a lot faster than typing every price into the cash register, and they take inventory at the same time. <clears throat> Carpenters use nail guns and screw machines, which grossly increases the results of their labor. A riding mower that costs a few thousand dollars <clears throat> does the work of two or three men with push mowers. Hydraulic dumpsters let the driver do the entire operation. Even dishwashers are more efficient. Productivity is increasing in virtually all occupations. So, what we would expect if unemployable people could not produce enough that they could be paid the legal minimum wage is that as productivity increased, the number of unemployable people would steadily decline. But as we know, that does not happen. If wages increased with productivity, the legal minimum wage would become superfluous. But they don't. So we are still debating how much to raise the legal minimum wage in order to keep up with inflation. The reality is the very least productive people are always unemployable. Productivity continues to increase, but there are never enough jobs. Why aren't there enough jobs? Can you live and produce without land? It is on the land that we live, and from it we produce food, clothing, shelter, and all the other products we consume in the satisfaction of our desires. Is there any free land in the United States where you can go and live and employ yourself? We have 700,000 square miles of arable land. That's 465 people per square mile. By comparison, France has nearly 860 and the United Kingdom has over 2,700 people per square mile. America had free land and with it full employment and the highest wages in the world. What happened to the free land? Here is a hypothetical territory. Our first settler is looking for the very best land that is still free. She gets across the swamp and the river and then beset by the sameness and richness, she stops somewhere, anywhere, and builds herself a homestead. The second settler arrives and asks, is that your cabin? Are all those crops that are growing yours? Yes. Well, what makes them yours? I built that cabin. I planted those crops. They are the fruits of my labor. Yes, everyone believes they have a right to keep what they produce, but you staked off a couple hundred acres of land, the surface of the earth. Are you saying that you have made that too? No, but I was the first to claim it. Well, if claiming something made it yours, someone would surely have claimed the entire earth thousands of years ago. Listen, <clears throat> there's only two of us who even know about this place. If you'll acknowledge this 160 acres is mine, I'll acknowledge that 160 acres is yours. I'll keep off your land if you'll keep off mine. And if anyone comes along and tries to take it, <sighs> we'll stick together. It's a deal. And now we have title to land. Without title to land, who would plant a crop, much less build a house or a modern factory, for they couldn't protect what they produced on the land. And now a third settler comes along. Do the first two settlers have any advantage over the newcomer? The land is just as fertile. It is just as close to the river. As long as there is land of equal uh, quality that is free, title to land gives an opportunity to keep what you produce on the land and nothing more. 
That is, until the free land that's available to others is of lesser quality. This land might be just as fertile, but the swamp will impede your ability to trade and diminish production. Now the land is less fertile, and that diminishes the quality of opportunity and increases the advantage. Now the land that's still free is even less fertile. I've drawn a red line that indicates the free land frontier. All the land to the left is owned. All the land to the right is still free. And <clears throat> along come Tom, Dick, and Harry to the free land. About that time, lightning strikes. The cabin and everything our first settlers worked all these years <clears throat> to produce is gone. She survived with little more than she started with when she first arrived more than a decade ago. Now there is only the land, much as it was when she first discovered it. To make it plausible, I'll say she gets word that she's just inherited her uncle's estate. So, before she leaves, she decides to rent her land to the highest bidder. Now let's say, on any 160 acres of the best land, we add up the value of what could be produced by the average worker with his tools and equipment, and it equals $9 per day. On the next best grade of land, because of the swamp, it's only eight, and because it's less fertile, the next grade yields seven, while the land that's still free yields, on average, $6 a day. If Tom can only produce half what the average worker can produce, the most he could offer is $1.50 a day, the difference between what he could produce on the free land and what he could produce on the best land. If he had to pay any more, he would be better off working on his own land, at the free land frontier, where he keeps it all. Dick is the average worker. He could produce $6 a day at the frontier, or $9 a day on the best land. He could bid any amount up to $3 per day, but to make it worth his while, Let's say that he bids $2.90. Harry can produce <coughs> double the average. He could bid anything up to $6 per day. But in order to beat all other bids, all he has to offer is $3 per day. 18 minus 3 equals $15 per day. That's more than the $12 he could produce in his own land at the frontier. The most productive workers can always outbid everyone else and get the best land. Suppose you're one of the best blacksmiths in the country. Where would you get the most customers? Would it be the free land where the population is sparse or the land near the city where there are many more businesses and customers that want your services? If you're the very best craftsman, you can outbid all the others and get the better location. Who went west when there was free land? The college graduates and skilled craftsmen or the young adventurers? At the frontier, there's no rent to pay, so no matter how little you produce, you keep it all. Now let's turn it around. Our second settler is getting too old to work. She wants to hire the average worker with his tools and equipment to work her land. If he works where the land is free, he can only produce $6 a day. If he works on her land, the best land, he can produce $9 a day. How much of the $9 a day that he produces would she have to pay him? Since no one will work for someone else, unless they are paid at least as much as they could produce working for themselves where the land is free, the average worker will have to be paid at least $6 per day on her land on the left side of the river. $9 produced minus 
$6, which goes to the producer, equals $3 in land rent. So whether we're referring to how much goes to the producers or how much goes to the owners of superior land, it's really two sides of the same equation. Now, we normally think of capital as anything that yields an income. But in this thesis, only products which are used to produce more products for sale and products in the course of being made and sold are called capital. It includes everything from a chemical factory and a railroad train to a box of cereal on the shelf in the grocery store. All items of capital are produced by people. Therefore, <coughs> land is not capital because it is the gift of nature. Labor produces capital out of the natural resources and then uses it to affect a greater efficiency. Since all capital is not owned by the users, it must be asked, how is wealth divided between the users and the owners of capital? Wages for labor, interest for capital. Why are we willing to pay interest? Might be another way to ask the question. And this is very important because it is so easy to think that low wages and poverty result from the private ownership of capital. In fact, most people would say it is because you can produce so much with capital. With capital, you can move mountains. Without capital, you'd be lucky to produce much more than enough to stay alive. Think how much computer, electronic office equipment have increased productivity. Computers are in cars, trucks, trains, planes, just about every machine that you can think of. However, if I can think of one example where capital increases productivity, but no one is willing to pay interest, then there must be another reason why people are willing to pay interest. Here are two hunters, James and William. To keep the example pure, I'll say that each of them have the same skill and knowledge. However, James has two bows and two sets of arrows. The complete, tan the concrete and tangible results of his labor. William has none. James says to William, I will lend you a bow and a set of arrows if you will give me the difference between what you catch with the bow and the arrows and what you would likely have caught with sticks and stones. Does William have any alternative? The answer is yes. He can make his own bow and arrows. It takes two weeks to make a bow and a set of arrows, and they can be used for 50 weeks before they wear out. If William borrows the bow and arrows, he can hunt for the first 50 weeks of the year. He can then take the two remaining weeks to make a new bow and a set of arrows for return. That way, he returns exactly what he borrowed, a new bow and a set of arrows. Or he could take the first two weeks of the year, make his own bow and a set of arrows, and he could then hunt for the remaining 50 weeks of the year. Either way, he would end up with 50 weeks worth of meat and fur and a worn out bow and a set of arrows. Therefore, if any interest is required, William would be better off making his own bow and arrows. The use of capital grossly increased the results of labor, but the hunter was not willing to pay interest because there was no benefit to the hunter. And if all capital was of the nature of bows and arrows, the payment of interest would probably be the exception and not the rule. But let's look at another form of capital. My neighbor invites all her friends over for homemade wine party. Oh, this is delicious. Where did you get the recipe? 
Oh, I got it off the internet. Here, here's the web address. I hope you enjoy it. Would you all like to come and see my basement? Yes, yes, we would. Oh, wow. We're all thinking the same thing at the same time. If you lend each of us a barrel of wine, we will keep it for you and make you a fresh barrel of wine whenever you want it. Just give us a week's notice. That way, you'll have fresh wine at all times and the use of your basement. Well, what do we know about wine? Does it lose value as it gets older? No, it increases in value over time. If she keeps the wine, the increase in value will be hers. If you want to borrow the wine, she expects you to pay her for the increase in value. Wouldn't the same principle apply to crops that grow? Wouldn't the apples be the interest from the investment in the apple tree? Or seedlings that become timber? Or animals that grow? See how different hunting or carpentry is from growing? The carpenter goes home on Saturday, rests up on Sunday, and comes back to work on Monday. The building is not worth any more than it was when he left. When capital is used to make things, the primary benefit of capital is in the use of capital, and the primary beneficiary is the user. In the second mode of production, growing, as in farming or aging wine, the primary benefit of capital is in the increase of capital, and the primary beneficiary is the owner of the capital. Any labor that is necessary to affect the increase must be paid out of the increase. In the case of farming, it would be the crops that grow. And they must be paid as much as they would have produced if they had applied their labor in adapting, like hunting or building houses. Just as anyone who wants to borrow capital for hunting or carpentry would have to pay the owner of that capital as much as it would have increased in value if it were maintained in a form capable of increasing in value, like wine or corn that grows. And if the meat and fur were superior to what they would be in two weeks, a hunter might very well be willing to pay interest. Rabbits increase faster than horses. So, as more rabbits are offered for sale, the value of rabbits fall. As fewer horses are offered for sale, the value of horses increase. Supply and demand brings the returns to each into an equilibrium. Capital can also harness the productive forces of nature. In this case, a solar collector or a windmill. While the windmill is being built, it yields no energy. But once in place, it delivers electric without additional labor. The owner can build another or go on vacation. The windmill delivers electric, and for that, the benefit, people are willing to pay interest. You cipher and type your grandmother's uh, memoirs. The first copy takes weeks, maybe even months. The second copy and every one thereafter takes seconds. Would we not be willing to pay interest for not having to repeat those steps that were originally necessary? Suppose every modern steel mill was destroyed. It doesn't mean we would never have steel again, but we would certainly have to make the first batch in a far less efficient way. Wouldn't we be willing to pay interest for not having to repeat those far less efficient steps that were originally necessary? To give a practical example, let's say that you have a bookkeeping service. You borrow $2,000 worth of computer equipment and it triples the results of your labor. Could the lender claim two-thirds of all your income? Of course not. Interest does not represent the greater result from the use of capital. It represents only the advantage of time in the use of existing capital. A demand for capital is a demand for the labor to produce it. 
wages and interest rise and fall together. Wages equal the entire product minus what is necessary to induce the storing up of capital where the land is free. Interest will be, as inferred in the law of wages, what is necessary to induce the storing up of capital where the land is free. Individual wages depend upon the supply and demand for particular skill and knowledge. The return to individual applications of capital depend upon the risk, which in the total averages out. Labor and capital are the producers. On one side, and landowners who take part of what other people produce are on the other. Returning to our hypothetical territory, here it is in a simple subtraction equation. Everyone can go to the free land with their labor and capital and on average pursue, produce $6 a day. Therefore, they will have to be paid $6 per day on all better land. Land rent will be the difference. 9 minus 6 equals 3, 8 minus 6 equals 2, and so on. The population increases and the frontier extends to less potentially productive land. Wages and interest fall to five on all better land because only land that will yield five is still free. And the rent goes up on each grade of land, four, three, two, one. However, as people come together in communities, a division of labor becomes possible. Some people grow food, some make clothing, others build shelter. Far more is produced with specialization in trade than would result if each person produced their own food, clothing, and shelter. So productivity doubles. The increase in productivity more than compensates for the extension of the frontier now far more is produced on less potentially productive land, so wages and interest increase to $10 a day. And the rent of land increases as well, from three to eight. On the best land, six, four, two. Inventions like the reaper, the thresher, the steam engine, and electric motors increase productivity. So does the infrastructure. We build a bridge across the swamp and the, and the, the river and roads connecting the agricultural community to what was the best crop land, but is now the center of a little village with a blacksmith shop and the general store, the post office, and the veterinarian. Productivity doubles again with $36 per day on the best land. The capital is different and the ratios are bigger, but it is the same concept. And the greater productivity increases the demand for land. Bigger buildings and machinery require more materials. With tractors and equipment, more land can be farmed, so the frontier extends to less potentially productive land. And here it is in the model. But once again, the increase in productivity more than compensates for the extension of the frontier, and the net result is that wages and interest go from 10 to 16. And the rent goes up to 20, 16, 12, 8, 4. Now let's take another look at the distribution. 
as productivity increased, wages and interest went from 6 to 10 and then to 16. While rents on the best land went from 3 to 8 to 20 as the frontier extended to less potentially productive land. Six was two-thirds of nine. Sixteen is, is less than half of 36. Wages and interest are becoming a smaller portion of the product, even though they are increasing as an amount. When the first settler came, she worked hard with her tools and equipment and got $9 per day. Now, with the same amount of work, tools, and equipment, she'll get $36 a day. If she gets someone else to do the work and supply the capital, they get 16 and she gets 20 All because of other people and the presence and cooperation of the community. If she had it to do over, would she have only taken the land she needed, or would she likely have taken all the land she could get? Suppose one out of every four parcels were unused, simply held for the increase in its value. Speculation. You can see how this prematurely extends the frontier. And it's not just unused land. It's land that is grossly underused, like the self-storage units in the suburbs or surface parking lots in the cities, where minimal use pays the taxes while land appreciates in value. It's buildings that were never replaced as population increased and the most efficient use became much, much higher. And all this prematurely extends the frontier driving wages down and rents up. Because one-fourth of each grade of land was held out of use, the margin extended two full grades. And wages and interest went from 16 down to 8, while on the best land, rent went from 20 up to 28. And that is to say nothing of how unused and underused land impedes cooperation and diminishes production. What happens to wages and interest when there is no free land? Let's start with the least skilled and educated workers. They have no way to employ themselves. There is no free land. If they don't work, they'll starve. So, they work for food, clothing, and shelter. Essentially, the same pay as a chattel slave. If they don't get enough to stay healthy, they produce less, and the landowner they work for gets less. What about the skilled workers? They have no way to employ themselves either, but they can increase productivity and the incomes of the landowners they work for. So, landowners compete by paying higher wages, which encourages others to learn the skill and accumulate the knowledge. And that increases the supply relative to the demand for superior workers. So, the higher wages of superior workers will depend upon the difficulty of acquiring the knowledge and skill needed for each job. Ultimately, their wages will be an amount below which the supply of each level, type, and level of superior worker would not meet demand, and productivity would fall. What about the return to capital? Buildings, machines, products being made. Without free land, you have no place to put your capital. You have to rent the land from someone else or lend your capital to a landowner. Either way, the rate of interest falls to the point below which there would be a shortage of capital. Productivity would fall and the landowner would get less rent. This is generally closer to the rate of return on corporate bonds than the rate of corporate profits. Now, taking the wages of unskilled labor, skilled labor, and capital all together, if it added up to $3 per day, below which productivity would fall, then in the model, the rent on the best land would be $33, $29, $25.
and so on. Speculation deprived labor and capital of all the gains in material progress, driving wages and interest to a bare minimum, no matter how much they produce. Ameliorated by the minimum wage, the eight-hour day, public housing, and other interventions. Even taxes cannot lower wages below the amount at which productivity would fall. It is true that people on the minimum wage pay little in taxes, and those with a family get a subsidy. Governments can raise the minimum wage and then tax it back. But in the free market, if taxes took 25% away from all wages and interest, that would lower the rewards of labor and capital, it would lower productivity, and the rent of land would fall with it. Therefore, after taxes, wages and interest must still be sufficient to maximize production. In this model, wages and interest will have to be raised to four so that after taxes, the workers and capitalists can actually get three. And that means that the rent falls by the same $1 per day that wages and interest were raised. Of course, landowners also pay income taxes. So 25% from 32 is 8. 25% of 28 is 7, and so on. And that leaves 21, uh, 24, 21, 18 for the landowners. All taxes are paid out of what would otherwise go to the owners of land and other monopolies, because wages are already at the point below which productivity would fall. The more land that is held for speculation, the more people will be unemployed. As population increases and inventions replace workers, more land is needed. Now, what causes recessions and depressions? That is to say, what causes the cyclic increase in unemployment? In 2008, we had the same workforce with the same skills, the same level of technology, the same natural resources, the same buildings and machines, and essentially the same money and credit system that we had in 2007. Yet many more people who were willing and able to work were unable to exchange their labor for the products of other people's labor. What happened? If the recession were caused by the housing crisis, how could that be? Well, we take the story of Bill, who builds individual homes on site. He employs 100 workers, and he builds 20 homes per year. But he loses a lot of time on account of the weather. With a factory, he could build houses rain or shine, day or night. With a factory, he could build 20 houses with 60 workers. The payment on the factory would be equal to the pay of 10 workers. So that's a 30% savings in the cost of production. Delivered by truck and assembled in a day. Or he could build a really big factory. He could keep all 100 workers. And the really big factory would cost the same as hiring 30 more workers. But it yields three times as many houses. 60 houses per 100 workers, which is a 56% reduction in the cost. What did Henry Ford do each time he was able to make cars cheaper? He lowered prices, expanded sales, and his profits increased. The price of buildings are going down. Sales of buildings are going up. What happens to the demand for farmland near the suburbs that's suitable for building houses on? Suppose you were offered $1 million last year. 
That's 10,000 per acre for a 100 acre farm. Now you're offered 1,150,000 for the very same piece of land. You just made 15% by not selling. The price of houses keeps going down. The demand for land to put them on keeps going up. New homes are better insulated. Heating and cooling systems are more efficient. Houses require less maintenance. The price of everything that comes from China is falling and all those savings give people more money to bid up the price of land on which to park a house. Now you're offered 20% more for your land. Are you more or less likely to sell? How many times can you sell the same piece of land? It's not just land for housing. It's mineral, manufacturing, and commercial land. All the land is used to live and work on, including a place to put a house factory. Sooner or later, as more and more landowners chose to wait for even higher values, there would not have been enough places to put the increasing number of houses being sold. But before that actually happened, credit was suddenly withdrawn in 2006. In the expectation of even greater savings in the cost of production and the cost of living, more and more credit had been extended to pay higher and higher speculative prices of her land. Then, suddenly, credit was withdrawn. Developers who would have bought the land, subdivided it, and built the local infrastructure could no longer afford to buy it. Homeowners could no longer afford to pay such high prices for a place to put their house. And the landowners who might have sold when credit was flowing freely refused to sell at the far lower prices being offered. If the land was not available for all those houses that Bill was able to build, what was he going to do? Go back to making them one at a time when the weather permitted or lay off the third shift? The guys that aren't working won't be buying a new car or a refrigerator and they won't be going on vacation. That reduces the demand for cars, refrigerators, and hotel rooms at the beach. And the people in those industries get laid off. They won't be buying a new house either. And that further reduces the demand for houses and the land needed to put them on. If the recession is based on its own merits, as soon as the price of land stopped going up, the land would be sold. But too many sellers wait for the price to go up again. In 2006, the banks cut back on their loans to buy land for housing projects. The value of land started falling, but the landowners were waiting for the price to go back up. And although productivity was still increasing, in 2008, unemployment rose and wages began to fall. Next, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates, and eventually, after many months, some landowners accepted lower prices and some land was sold. Several million people went to work, and as time goes on, more land is likely to be sold, and more people will go to work. But long before there is really full employment, the price that is being offered for land will rise, and a new economic cycle will begin. So, we are back to the original question. How can we create full employment with increasing wages eliminate the business cycle, and finance, government, and social programs. Introducing the single tax on the rental value of land and no other taxes. Since you're only renting land, you will use as little as possible and produce as much as possible on it. Land speculation will stop. And when the public collection of rent is applied to the entire country, free land will again be available and full employment will be assured. The frontier in this model is backed up to the place where land speculation was introduced. In the model, the free land yields an average of $16 per day, so wages and interest everywhere will be $16 per day. Everyone gets to keep what they would have produced by taking advantage of the natural opportunities that are equally available to everyone, and the potential rent, which is taxed, 
measures the advantage received by some people over others. Furthermore, without a fair portion of the rent being spent on roads and police and schools, etc., the value of land would be a small fraction of what it is with these expenditures. Now I've divided wages and interest into what seems like a plausible ratio, so I can say that everyone gets everything they produce directly through their labor and indirectly through their capital as interest. And the community and society gets the rent. It results from an advantage, a superior opportunity granted by the government. Land is provided by nature and its value is enhanced by population and public investment. To a large extent, the rent of land results from the conscious and subconscious cooperation of the community as a whole. It is socially produced, and therefore it belongs to the community and society as a whole. Now, under these circumstances, let's say that new computers and robotics double productivity and again, the free land frontier is extended to the next best grade of land. Again, the increase in productivity more than compensates for the extension of the free land, and wages and interest increase. And the community and society get an increasing fund from the superior land. The land rent could pay for our current expenditures plus national health care, social security, medical research, developing safe energy, and as soon as we pay off the national debt, a cash dividend. Everyone benefits as individuals with higher wages and interest and as members of society with social programs. Collect the rental value of land for public purpose. Socialize all businesses that are in their nature monopolies businesses in which there cannot reasonably be competition, like the roads and pipes and wires that run along them, and abolish all other government-granted monopolies. If we do that, it is not only Detroit and Philadelphia, but every other distressed city in the United States that will be rebuilt with jobs, increasing wages, and affordable housing for all.